morning, afternoon, evening, wherever you are, and welcome to Global Atheist News. This week's headlines. Islamic State leader Abu Ibrahim al Qurayshi was killed in Syria. A Haringey teenager accused of Jewish hate crime was remanded in custody. Iran is accused of sowing Israeli discontent with fake Jewish Facebook group. A new French law to criminalize conversion therapy is passed. A US woman is held for leading a female IS group. The Canadian Freedom Convoy hits Parliament Hill, demanding an end to vaccine mandates. Whoopi Goldberg is sorry over her Holocaust remarks. An Australian Christian school demands parents sign a contract that allows it to expel students who come out as gay. Meredith Doig invites the Attorney General, Michaelia Cash, to attend an RSA meeting. Opening prayers are removed from a council in Australia. The leader of the Islamic State, IS, is dead following a US raid in northern Syria that also killed a senior deputy of the terror group, US officials say. Abu Ibrahim al Hashimi al Qureshi set off a blast killing himself and his family as special forces rounded on his hideout after a gunfight. US President Joe Biden disclosed the overnight raid on Thursday. Qureshi's death removed a major ter terrorist threat to the world, Mr. Biden said. U.S. officials did not name the IS deputy who was also killed, but provided dramatic details of the operation that had been months in the planning. IS has so far made no public comment. Several U.S. experts told the BBC that Qureshi's death would be a blow to IS, but the group would ultimately regroup. See this video. A teenager accused of hitting a Jewish man with a smashed glass bottle in an anti-Semitic attack in North London has been remanded in custody. Malachi Thorpe, 18, is alleged to have targeted two people as they closed their shop in Haringey. He is accused of stamping on a yamulka, a religious skullcap, and using the bottle as a weapon. The pair, described in court as both visibly orthodox Jewish, were treated in hospital for injuries. Mr. Thorpe appeared at Highbury Corner Magistrates Court after being charged with two counts of racially aggravated actual bodily harm and one count of possessing an offensive weapon. District Judge Michael Oliver remanded him into custody ahead of a further hearing at Woodgreen Crown Court on the 3rd of March. 
A suspected Iranian disinformation unit ran an elaborate network on Facebook targeting nationalist and ultra-religious Jews in Israel in an attempt to stoke division and inflame tensions with Palestinians, according to research shared exclusively with the BBC. The alleged foreign interference campaign ran across multiple social media platforms posing as an ultra-Orthodox Jewish news group supportive of extreme right-wing groups. Its goal was to help fuel religious war by amplifying fear, hatred and chaos, according to the Israeli disinformation watchdog Fake Reporter, which uncovered the group's suspected Iranian origin. This is the latest sign of a growing disinformation battleground on social media and messaging apps in Israel. The network became active after last year's flare-up in sectarian violence in the country. Facebook and Twitter deactivated the group's pages and associated profiles after being approached by fake reporter. The BBC approached the group's administrator pages, asking their location and why they used copied content, but they did not respond. The Iranian embassy in London did not respond to requests for comment. The network went to extensive lengths to look genuine, creating a page for a fictitious bakery in an ultra-Orthodox Israeli town, and in another case, stealing the online identity of an ultra-religious Jewish man from Russia who died four years ago. France has passed a new law criminalizing the use of so-called conversion therapy to attempt to change the sexual orientation or gender identity of LGBTQ people. Anyone convicted under the new law could face fines of up to 30,000 euros, 25,000 pounds, and two years in jail. President Emmanuel Macron praised the move, tweeting that being oneself is not a crime. The bill will now take force in the next 14 days, once signed off by Mr. Macron. Lawrence Van Soenbroek, an MP with President Macron's ruling En Marche party, sponsored the bill through the Assembly and said that the law gave a strong signal because we are formally condemning all those who consider a change of sex or identity as an illness. Clement Beaune, the Europe minister in Mr Macron's centrist government, who is gay, tweeted that he was proud of this agreement. United Nations experts have repeatedly condemned conversion therapy, which can use group sessions, injections, electric shocks and prayer in its attempts to alter LGBTQ people's identities. The law comes as France marks 40 years since the decriminalization of homosexuality. An American woman has been arrested and charged with organizing and leading an all-female battalion of the Islamic State group. Alison Fluke Ekren, a mother who once lived in Kansas, allegedly trained women and children to use AK-47 assault rifles and suicide vests in Syria. She is also suspected of recruiting operatives for a potential future attack on a US college campus. Ms. Fluke Ekren could face up to 20 years in prison if convicted. The battalion was said to be comprised solely of female IS members who were married to male IS fighters. Ms. Fluke Ekren is suspected of becoming the leader and organizer of the group soon after she joined it. It is alleged that her main role was to teach women how to defend themselves against the enemies of IS. She is said to have succeeded in getting several IS women trained up 
in the use of AK-47 rifles, grenades, and suicide belts. She is also accused of teaching children to use assault weapons. And in the FBI affidavit, a witness is quoted as saying that one of Ms. Fluke Ekron's sons was seen holding a machine gun. He was five or six years old at the time. As well as her suspected role in Syria, Ms. Fluke Ekron is also accused of planning and recruiting operatives for an attack on a college campus in the US. She also allegedly told a witness of her desire to carry out an attack on a shopping mall using explosives and reportedly said that it would be a waste of resources if it did not kill a lot of people. Ms. Flukekren is charged with providing and conspiring to provide material support or resources to a foreign terrorist organization and she faces up to 20 years in prison if found guilty. The Freedom Convoy began in part over a federal government decision to impose a vaccine mandate on cross-border Canadian truckers, requiring those who are unvaccinated to quarantine when re returning to Canada. The United States has imposed a similar mandate, with unvaccinated truckers having to quarantine as well when entering their country. President Trudeau has previously said that nearly 90% of Canadian truckers are vaccinated. Conservative leader Erin O'Toole on Friday met with some participants of the convoy and said he supports the truckers' right to be heard. Some Conservative MPs, as well as Par People's Party representative of Canada leader Maxime Bernier, and independent Ontario MPP Randy Hillier was spotted on the hill on Saturday greeting protesters. NDP leader Jarmet Singh condemned the presence of the Conservative MPs, saying that those who attended have endorsed a convoy led by those that claim the superiority of the white bloodline and equate Islam to a disease. Many protesters have plans to return to the hill for a second day of rallies with the GoFundMe page for the Freedom Convoy updated to include an itinerary for Sunday that lists a prayer service in the morning on Parliament Hill and a press conference in the afternoon at an undisclosed location. See this video. Good evening. We began tonight with the chaotic protests, smaller in scale, but keeping the core at a standstill. Ontario's COVID measures easing today, but not for businesses in the heart of this city where fear, vandalism and blocked roads kept them closed. A live look now at Parliament Hill, the gathered crowd, fewer trucks in the weekend, but still keeping Ottawa's core at a standstill. The latest tonight, the city's downtown still paralyzed. Some residents report even getting the essentials is difficult. Ottawa police have set up a hate crime hotline. Officers will be redeployed to respond to citizens' complaints. All of this on a day when Ontario is lifting restrictions, but in the core, businesses stayed shut. People who live in center town say they've had enough of the horns and lockdown, telling the truckers it is time to go home. CTV's Jeremy Sharon has covered this protest since it began and starts us off tonight. Jeremy. Well, Patricia, it was supposed to be a good day for businesses in the capital, a chance to reopen and get much needed business back. Instead, they've been dealing with difficult conditions in the downtown since Friday. Many businesses here in the market, center town, and even outside of the core choosing to stay closed, worried about the impact from the protest. <laughs> This has been the backdrop in the capital's core for nearly three full days now. The noise, the traffic, and the crowds, a major setback for businesses looking to bounce back from lockdowns. Obviously, everybody's got the right to protest, and they've been here for two days and message received, but now we're all hurting too. And, you know, the message is freedom, and they want to help business. So you're not helping me. Steps from the heart of the convoy, Metropolitan Brasserie has closed its doors for the third day in a row. Its name, part of a list circulating online, thought to be supporting the protest, but that isn't the case. I would just say people need to be very careful with misinformation out there. Um, like I said, we've been closed for the weekend, and 
some of that information can be very damaging to a business. In the Byward Market at Saslov's Meat Market, the store vandalized while closed through the weekend. It's, it's vandalism. It's destruction of personal property. Today, trying to reopen, but ready to change course if needed. Well, it is frustrating. You know, we have a product that we have to sell. It's all perishable items. We have staff that depend on their jobs. Uh, to pay their bills, uh, you know, it's fr it's very frustrating. Unfortunately, uh, we're left with a lot of a lot of anxiety, a lot of uh, a lot of concerns uh, for for businesses, for their employees, and for uh, for residents in our area. The Rideau Center here in the core remained closed Monday. The mall announced Saturday it would close for the weekend due to large groups gathering inside and refusing to wear masks. The case too at hotels across the city where officials say maskless guests have been mostly peaceful. You know, there's always the fringe minority that are there to cause trouble. The Hotel Association says they've relaxed mask mandates to avoid confrontations. There is word two protesters are booking already to return next weekend. Unfortunately, there were a lot of incidents where, where we did have to try to accommodate those guests that didn't realize the protest ended at the front door of the hotel. And so on this reopening day, many businesses in the capital getting far from the boost they had long hoped for. Now the question is still unanswered about how long this protest will last. Businesses tell me every day is crucial as many have been waiting weeks now to welcome people back, Graham. And a long few days for you. CTV's Jeremy Sharon on the beat again for us tonight. Whoopi Goldberg is facing a backlash after she said on a US talk show that the Holocaust was not about race. The actress and television personality said on ABC's The View that the Nazi genocide of the Jews involved two groups of white people. She apologized, but in a muddled attempt to clarify her comments, ended up having to say sorry again. The Nazis, who believed themselves to be an Aryan master race, murdered six million Jews in the Holocaust. Co-host Joy Bihar pointed out that the Nazis said the Jews were a different race. Goldberg said, but it's not about race, it's not. It's about man's inhumanity to other man. But it's about white supremacy, responded co-host Anna Navarro. It's about going after Jews and gypsies and Roma. But these are two groups of white people countered Goldberg. Co-host Sarah Haynes pointed out that the Nazis didn't see them as white. Jonathan Greenblatt, leader of the Anti-Defamation League, a Jewish anti-hate watchdog, tweeted, No, at Whoopi Goldberg, the Holocaust was about the Nazis' systematic annihilation of the Jewish people who they deemed to be an inferior race. They dehumanized them and used this racist propaganda to justify slaughtering six million Jews. Holocaust distortion is dangerous. Meghan McCain, a former co-host of The View, tweeted, anti-Semitism is a cancer and a poison that is increasingly excused in our culture and television, and it permeates spaces that should shock us all. Conservative commentator Ben Shapiro tweeted a quote from Nazi leader Adolf Hitler, who wrote in Mein Kampf, is not their very existence founded on one great lie, namely that they are a religious community, whereas in reality they are a race. The US Holocaust Museum, in what was interpreted as a subtweet at Goldberg, wrote, racism was central to Nazi ideology, Jews were not defined by religion, but by race. Nazi racist beliefs fueled genocide and mass murder. Amid growing criticism, Goldberg later apologized again. A Christian school in Brisbane has asked parents to sign an enrollment contract that allows it to expel a child who comes out as gay just a week before the school year begins. City Point Christian College at Carindale in Brisbane Southeast sent the extraordinary contract to parents in which it describes homosexuality as immoral and said it will not recognize a student's claim to a gender identity. 
It also states it would only acknowledge gender assignment given at birth. We believe that any form of sexual immorality, including but not limiting to adultery, fornication, homosexual acts, bisexual acts, bestiality, incest, paedophilia, and pornography is sinful and offensive to God and is destructive to human relationships and society, part of the contract states. The contract includes new terms referring to a student's biological sex that parents must agree to for a child to be enrolled. Whilst each student is individually valued and equally encouraged to pursue opportunities in both academic and co-curricular activities, I, stroke we, agree that where distinctions are made between male and female, inclusive of, but not limited to, for example, uniforms, presentation, terminology, use of facilities and amenities, participating in sporting events and accommodation, such distinctions will be applied on the basis of the individual's biological sex, it states. Failure to agree to the terms will afford City Point Christian College the right to exclude a student from the college who no longer adheres to the college's doctrinal precepts, including those as to biological sex. The issuing of the contract has sparked a change.org online petition that seeks to have the contract recalled and which currently has over 27,000 signatures. State MP for the area, Corrine McMillan, also took to social media to say she was appalled by the, en the enrollment contract. Families seeking a Christian education should not have to contend with discrimination based on their child's gender or sexuality, she posted. All policies and rules in all Queensland schools must reflect the Queensland Anti-Discrimination and Human Rights Acts. In a statement posted on the school's website, its principal, Pastor Brian Mulheron, said the school has always held these Christian beliefs we have tried to be fair and transparent to everyone in our community by making them clear in the enrollment contract. The statement said the contract allowed parents and students to make an informed choice about whether they could support the school's approach to Christian education. Meredith Doy, president of the Rationalist Society of Australia, issued an invitation to Attorney General Michaelia Cash see this video. Recently we sent Senator Michaela Cash an invitation to be a guest at one of the Rationalist Society's monthly webinars to speak about the Religious Discrimination Bill. Uh, Cash has said on a number of occasions that the bill will treat uh, religion and non-religion or religious belief and non-religious belief equally. Well we're interested to speak with her about how that will work. So far, her government has completely ignored the voices of the non-religious in this country. Uh, last year, during consultations that led up to the development of the third version of the Religious Discrimination Bill, religious lobbyists were given privileged access to the drafting of the bill. Last June, we wrote to Senator Cash seeking a meeting with her so that we could put our point of view on behalf of the non-religious. No response. Adding insult to injury, uh, during the last couple of weeks when there have been parliamentary inquiries into the Religious Discrimination Bill, no fewer than 41 religious groups uh, appeared before the inquiries not one invitation was extended to a, an atheist, a humanist, a rationalist, or a pro-secular group, not one. Meantime, Senator Cash appears regularly on Christian media, including a one-hour webinar with the fundamentalist group Family Voice. So Senator Cash, will you accept our invitation 
to appear on our webinar to speak about the Religious Discrimination Bill and how it will treat the non-religious equally with the religious. We look forward to hearing from you. And also in Australia, we don't normally hear much from Australia, but today is an exception. There's some good news. Christian prayer rituals were successfully removed from the start of a council meeting. See this video. Reading of a Christian prayer is discriminating and holds no part in our public institutions, especially within the chamber of Shulhaven City Council. Local government is at the heart of its communities and local government plays an important role in fostering the inclusion and participation of all residents. Yet by reciting a Christian prayer at the start of meetings, it is exclusionary. It means that many elected representatives, staff members and members of the public that do not belong to the officially favoured religion are made to feel unwelcome and isolated. In short, they are made to feel other. While the rationalist society promotes freedom of religion, it also asserts that no particular faith should be guiding government. These are the words of the society's president, Dr. Meredith Doak. If you genuinely believe in freedom of religion, then you must allow others the right to freedom from religion. In a liberal democratic society, it must be true that everybody is free to believe whatever they want in the privacy of their own minds. But they are not free to manifest those beliefs in any way that they like. There are three principles that should be honoured in a pluralistic and democratic society like ours, and they are freedom, equality and separation. Freedom to practise one's faith or belief, as long as by doing so you do not harm others or impinge on their rights. Equality between religious and non-religious worldviews, so that neither has an advantage or disadvantage. And separation between religious institutions and those of the state. By having a moment of reflection at the start of each meeting, it allows each councillor and all those present to offer a silent prayer to whoever or whatever they believe in quietly and respectfully and allows for the inclusion of all. Thank you. Free Thought Hour, my interview show, will be starting in a few minutes, so stay tuned to this channel. This week's guest is Paul Thompson, a computer boffin who has been a skeptic and atheist activist for many years. You know how we all remember where we were on 9-11? Paul was at the North Tower. Come and chat with us or ask questions live. The GAN team will be back with our weekly news review next week. Please like, share, subscribe, set the notifications, etc. This has been Global Atheist News. Thank you for watching.